Be sure to watch part one on the Italian Renaissance before watching this mega extended supreme epic bonus director's cut textbook talky stuff on the art and artists of the Italian Renaissance. Humans have been creating art for tens of thousands of years, but it was during the Renaissance that art began to feel more modern. No, not modern art, but art that represented the new modern age the world was entering. Wait, that's too modern. That's more like it. Church leaders during the Renaissance beautified Rome and other cities by spending huge amounts of money for art. They became patrons of the arts by financially supporting artists. Renaissance merchants and wealthy families, including the Medici family in Florence, were also patrons of the arts by supporting artists and their workshops full of artists and training. But what is an artist in this world but a servant? A lackey for the rich and powerful. Before we even begin to work to feed this craving of ours, we must find a patron. A rich man of affairs, or a merchant, or a prince, or a pope. That's one way of explaining it. The art world worked differently 500 years ago. Nowadays, artists create art and then sell it in a gallery. During the Renaissance, artists were commissioned and paid to create works for the buyers. Patrons during the Renaissance had their portraits painted or donated art to the city to place in public squares to demonstrate their own importance. Some rich business people still do this today. But as the Italian Renaissance advanced from the Middle Ages into the modern age, artistic styles changed. Medieval artists had used religious subjects to convey a spiritual ideal, but the works of the Middle Ages appear stiff, flat, and lack any genuine expression of emotion. The people usually look bored. Their faces and bodies were also usually stylized, meaning they all looked the same, almost cartoonish. Notice how Mary's face looks the same as the surrounding angels? Maybe you've noticed in many cartoons, the people and objects have a similar look and style. A tree looks like a tree, but it doesn't look like a real tree. A nose on a face looks like a nose, but it doesn't look like someone's nose. No, no, that's better. Medieval artists were not trying to make their religious paintings look beautiful per se, but were just trying to represent the spirituality of the scene. They definitely were not trying to make the religious subjects physically attractive to the viewers. Oh, and medieval artists were really into gold. I love gold! Making the works look unnatural. By the way, it was actual gold leafing placed onto the works. But then art changed during... The Renaissance! Yes, well, thank you. Uh, the Renaissance. Art from the Renaissance looks much more realistic and lifelike. Artists used the science of looking, using their knowledge of nature and anatomy in their art to make it more lifelike. Unlike in the Middle Ages, where it makes you wonder if the artist had ever looked at a human body before. Is that supposed to be a six-pack? Is that homunculus supposed to be a baby or a middle-aged man? I'll let you look up homunculus on your own time. Now those are babies. Renaissance babies. The use of light and shadow found in art during the Renaissance made these subjects look less flat and cartoonish than before. Renaissance painters also used the technique of perspective, which shows three dimensions on a flat surface. Perspective makes paintings and drawings appear more like the real world, not like the unrealistic works of the Middle Ages. This medieval classroom just doesn't look right. The perspective is way off. Is that teacher a giant? Although, this class is pretty realistic in the sense that you can see some students are talking instead of paying attention. And it looks like the student in the back is trying to put his head down and sleep. Anyway, we recognize that objects in the distance appear smaller and higher up in our view and seem to vanish in the distance. Renaissance artists and designers like Filippo Brunelleschi knew this. Notice how the people in the distance appear smaller and closer to the horizon? Now let's take a look at the work St. Jerome in his study by Antonello da Messina. Doesn't it feel like we're looking into the entranceway in St. Jerome's study? Even though this oil painting is relatively small, it has amazing detail and use of perspective. Look at all the books and objects on the shelves, and St. Jerome's shoes on the decorative tiles, and he has a pet cat. There's also a lion a symbol associated with St. Jerome, since he took a thorn out of the paw of a lion, so the story goes. You can also see all the way to the windows in the back of the building, showing the hilly countryside and the people going about their lives. There are even birds in the upper windows. You can learn how to use perspective, as well as other techniques of the great artists in your art class. Hi, I'm Bob Ross, host of the Joy of Painting television series. Thanks, Bob. Like in the Middle Ages, Renaissance artists often portrayed Christian religious subjects, but classical Greek and Roman subjects also became popular. Classicism, the referencing of ancient classical Greece and Rome, 
meant you might see Greek and Roman mythological figures popping up in Renaissance paintings, like Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, where Venus, the Roman goddess of love and fertility, is the subject. We'll talk about Botticelli in a moment. Greek and Roman architecture also became popular during the Renaissance. Buildings showed a revival of symmetry and proportions, along with columns, friezes, arches, and domes. Speaking of domes, in the city of Florence, at the cathedral that I can't pronounce, stands the tallest masonry dome in the world, designed and built by Mr. Perspective himself, Filippo Brunelleschi. The dome is a design and engineering marvel. It is nearly 150 feet wide and had to be built 180 feet above the ground, atop the existing walls of the cathedral. It would eventually reach over 375 feet high. Brunelleschi's unusual design used bricks set in a herringbone pattern. That's over 4 million bricks, which might explain why the dome's construction took 16 years to complete. The dome is actually two domes. The ceiling of the inner dome has religious frescoes, which were completed in 1579. As I said, Greek and Roman architecture made a comeback during the Renaissance, and so did sculpting. Statues before the Greeks tended to look stiff, stylized, and not very lifelike. As you can see in these ancient Egyptian examples, Greek statues usually felt more lifelike due to their contraposto pose, where the subject appears to rest their body weight casually on one leg, while the other leg is at rest. The Italian term contraposto means counterpoise. Notice the hips and shoulders aren't parallel. Notice how Socrates is standing in a relaxed and natural way, although he is missing most of his legs. These Greek statues were not stiff, but gave a sense of movement and balance. Here's Nike of Samothrace, the goddess of victory. It feels like she's leaning into the wind, ready to take flight, even without her head. The sense of balance and motion was what set Greek and Roman statues apart from earlier sculptures. Greek statues tend to be nude, or partially nude, emphasizing fitness and strength. This was an idealized portrayal, so the subjects looked perfect, or at least better than reality. Sort of like senior pictures, or a person's profile picture on social media. You know, I often get compared to a Greek statue. Hey, did you know that Greek and Roman and other ancient statues were usually colorfully painted? When Pompeii was discovered and the ash of Mount Vesuvius was excavated, Mosaics were found depicting painted statues, even an image of someone in the act of painting a statue. Over time, the paint came off the statue, so now we usually just see the pale, polished marble. This white polished marble became the favorite style in the Renaissance and through the modern age. We'll see some examples of the Greek and Roman influence on Renaissance sculptures in a moment. But first, I wanted to mention another characteristic of Renaissance art that set it apart from the Middle Ages. This was the influence of humanism. Humanism focused on human potential and achievements, a focus on the secular world, not just on the spiritual. So along with the religious art in the Renaissance, there became a new emphasis on regular individuals. Painters began to paint prominent citizens. These realistic portraits revealed what was distinctive about each person. Whenever you're studying Italian Renaissance art, you always hear about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's right. Raphael, Donatello, Leonardo, and Michelangelo, the four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Were named after great artists of the Italian Renaissance. Donatello, oh, I mean this Donatello, revived the classical style of sculpture with his idealized statue of David, a boy who, according to the Bible, slayed the giant Goliath and became a great king. Donatello's David was created in the late 1460s. Oh, there's Goliath's head. It was the first European sculpture of a large, freestanding nude since ancient times. Most statues of that time were part of the architecture of a building, found tucked away in a niche. Hey, that's Donatello. He made sculpture more realistic by carving natural postures and expressions that reveal a personality. Donatello's wooden sculpture of Mary Magdalene is not idealized in the classical style. She had been a woman of sin, but then became one of Jesus' most devoted followers. You can see her hair blends in with her tattered clothes, and her slightly open mouth reveals missing teeth, with an expression that pleads forgiveness for her sins. A very emotional work of art, much more emotional than what we saw in the Middle Ages. Leonardo da Vinci, nope, that's the wrong Leo. Leonardo da Vinci also created sculptures, but there is only one known surviving sculpture of his, Leonardo was known as a renaissance man. No, actually he was not a superhero. 
He is a true example of a Renaissance man, a term generally given to someone who excelled in many areas and had many talents. Leonardo, who was born in the Italian area of Vinci, is known as an artist, inventor, scientist, and even an architect, among other things. Leonardo's many interests are evident in the notebooks he left behind. He filled his notebooks and papers with observations and sketches on physics, botany, geology, cartography, geometry, and anatomy and physiology. His anatomical drawings were so accurate because he dissected and studied human cadavers. Leonardo's observations of nature and knowledge of the sciences helped his designs for mechanical inventions. Speaking of mechanical inventions, Leonardo designed all kinds of things, including war machines like this tank. Oh, and while working on these drawings and writings, Leonardo would write with his left hand or right hand and write forward or as a mirror image, meaning he had to look at it in a mirror to be able to read it. He also liked to draw grotesque people. But anyway, most people probably know Leonardo da Vinci from his paintings, although only about 15 of his paintings still exist today. Other paintings are not finished or worked on by other artists or no longer exist. In his paintings, he uses his observations of nature and anatomy to make them look more realistic than what we saw in the Middle Ages. In some of Leonardo's works, you can notice a triangle or pyramid shape, giving visual stability and balance to the composition. Leonardo painted one of the most iconic paintings in the world, the Mona Lisa, also known as La Gioconda. There's the triangle. The woman in the portrait seems so real that many writers have tried to explain the thoughts behind her smile. No one knows exactly who the model was for the painting. Some people think it is a self-portrait. Some people also believe that the eyes follow you wherever you go. But I don't know about that. Hey, did you know that the Mona Lisa was stolen? On Monday, August 21st, 1911, cleaning day at the Louvre in Paris, the Mona Lisa was discovered to be missing with no leads of its whereabouts. It was missing for two years when finally the trail of the missing painting led to an Italian, Vincenzo Perugia. Security in museums and around the Mona Lisa was much different than today. Perugia had worked at the Louvre for a time and simply walked in, took the Mona Lisa off the wall, wrapped it in a painter's smock, and walked out. He wanted to return the painting back to its native country of Italy. Oh, it was in France because Leonardo took the painting with him when he was invited to France by King Francis I in 1516. The king bought it, and it was eventually placed in the Louvre. The stolen painting was eventually returned to the Louvre in Paris, where it has been an icon ever since. Leonardo also produced the famous religious painting, The Last Supper. There had been many representations of The Last Supper before Leonardo and after, which shared common themes. Often, St. John the Evangelist is leaning on Jesus. Sometimes it looks like he's sleeping. Usually we see the apostles all on one side of the table, except for Judas. The halos point out the spiritual importance of the individuals in the painting. Notice Leonardo uses a triangle for Jesus and the use of perspective in the painting to focus the eye on Jesus at the center. It's amazing we can still see this painting at all, located on the wall of a dining hall in the convent of Santa Maria del Grazie in Milan. Over the last 500 years, it has survived the construction of a door through the wall and through Leonardo's work, as well as floods and earthquakes, and when the dining hall was used as a horse stable when Napoleon took over Milan. World War II brought devastation to the area around the wall of the Last Supper, but it managed to survive, in part due to the sandbags and scaffolding put up by the people of Milan. Thankfully, many works of art were protected and saved in the war, but not all. Like Leonardo, Michelangelo was also a Renaissance man. Michelangelo was an amazing sculptor, poet, architect, and he could draw and paint. Even his grocery lists were amazing. Of all of Michelangelo's artistic abilities, I'm most amazed by his sculpting ability. Here is a low relief that he started when he was only 15 years old. Relief is a sculpting technique where the subject looks raised above the attached background. I think the style is called relief because the sculptor is relieved that they only have to carve one side and not all the way around. Yeah. Here's another relief that he made when he was 17 years old. The statues Michelangelo carved in stone are really amazing works of art, like the Pietà at St. Peter's Basilica. The Pity depicts the lifeless Jesus in Mary's lap after the crucifixion. The lifelike details are extraordinary, from the veins in Jesus' arms to the hairs on his chin. You probably already noticed Michelangelo used the triangle shape, like Leonardo did. Something you may not have noticed is Michelangelo carved an inscription on the sash across Mary's chest stating that Michelangelo Buonarroti of Florentine was making this. It was the only sculpture he ever signed. David, of David and Goliath fame, 
is probably Michelangelo's most well-known sculpture. Unlike Donatello's version of David after his victory over the giant Goliath, Michelangelo depicts David holding his sling with a worried look on his face before going to battle. Notice the classical influence on the statue. As David is nude, his muscles and face are pretty idealized, and he has that contrapposto stance. Michelangelo carved the David from a single block of white marble. It stands 17 feet tall and weighs over 6 tons. That's over 12,000 pounds. When it was completed, a debate began over where the statue should be placed. It was originally supposed to be placed on the roof of the cathedral in Florence, but soon people realized it would be difficult to view and even more difficult to lift up to the roof. The leaders of Florence eventually decided to place it at the entrance to the town hall, where it stood outside until the late 1800s, when it was carefully moved into a gallery for safekeeping. A replica of David still stands outside in its place. Hey, do you know why Michelangelo made the right hand of the statue of David 11 inches long? Well, if he made the hand 12 inches long, it would have been a foot. <laughs> I can only imagine how difficult and demanding it was for Michelangelo to chisel David and all of his other sculptures. In fact, there are loads of unfinished sculptures by Michelangelo, like this Pietà. And that Pietà. This Pietà in Florence was almost finished, including Michelangelo's own face. He did finish the statue of Moses that is part of the tomb for Pope Julius II. The lifelike arms and the wild beard of Moses shine from Michelangelo's polish. Speaking of Pope Julius II, he is responsible for commissioning Michelangelo's most well-known paintings, the frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. The Sistine Chapel, which serves as the gathering place for the cardinals who picked the new pope, originally had a cool but not very memorable painting of the night sky but Michelangelo transformed it with scenes and characters from the Old Testament. There's the creation of the sun and the moon. Oh, uh, the other moon. There you go. There's the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and even David slaying Goliath. Located at the center of the ceiling is probably the most well-known image from the chapel, the creation of Adam. You know, some people say that Michelangelo snuck the shape of a brain into the painting of God. Framing the scenes, Michelangelo painted an architectural framework that isn't actually a part of the structure. You may have noticed that Michelangelo's painted figures really resemble the size and motion found in his statues. His statues were influenced by the strength and beauty of classical statues of the past, and Michelangelo used models to help shape their ideal bodies and faces. We're able to clearly see the colors and details of Michelangelo's work due to a long restoration and cleaning of the ceiling in the late 1900s. It took Michelangelo four years to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which is not a surprise because it stretches 134 feet long and is 46 feet wide. That's about the same area as two tennis courts or almost one and a half basketball courts. I assume that Michelangelo didn't have a fear of heights because the ceiling is 44 feet above the floor of the chapel. He created special scaffolding to work from and probably painted while in the uncomfortable position of standing up with his head tilted back, as you can see from his sketch. Although one could imagine Michelangelo painting at least some of the areas on his back, either way, it couldn't have been a very pleasant experience. We also need to remember that these paintings are frescoes. Fresco. Fresco means fresh in Italian. With a fresco, dry powder pigments are mixed with water and then applied to wet plaster on the wall. The plaster dries and the paint becomes permanently set in the wall. Since the artist was working with wet plaster, they only had 12 to 24 hours to paint their images before they dried, so they would put up as much wet plaster as they could paint in a day. In fact, sometimes you can see the edges of each day's plaster. To help with the speed and accuracy of painting, artists would draw cartoon sketches and then poke tiny holes along the drawn lines. They would then tap charcoal over the holes on the sheet, leaving a faint pattern of the image as a guide. The artist would connect the dots and fill in the image and the details. Hey, remember Leonardo's Last Supper? It's not a true fresco that was painted on wet plaster. Leonardo did not want to be rushed creating his painting, so he painted on dry plaster. As a result, the painting began to flake off within a few years. Michelangelo also used the fresco technique for the biblical story of the Last Judgment on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. It depicts the moment when the living and the dead are judged by Christ and their souls consigned to heaven or hell. This massive project, about half the size of a basketball court, shows Jesus at the center, next to his mother, the Virgin Mary, 
as she looks down to her right at the blessed, while Jesus looks down to his left at the cursed. Angels assist up the blessed, while demons harvest the new souls for hell. Michelangelo's use of nudes was seen as immoral and indecent by many at the time, and a censorship campaign began. Another artist was later hired to paint drapery over the genitals of the holy men in the fresco. Raphael was younger than Michelangelo and Leonardo, so Raphael learned from studying their works. One of Raphael's favorite subjects was the Madonna and child, and often portrayed their expressions as gentle and calm. He was famous for his use of perspective, which you can see in his most famous work, School of Athens, which really illustrates the classical influence on the Renaissance. This fresco, which was commissioned by Pope Julius II, shows classical philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, along with famous Renaissance figures, including Raphael himself. Raphael wasn't the only Renaissance artist to sneak himself into a painting. Sandro Botticelli, who was not a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, also included himself in his work, Adoration of the Magi, where the three magi, or kings, bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to lay before the baby Jesus. Botticelli also included the patron who commissioned the work, as well as members of the powerful Medici family. Botticelli created other versions of the same scene, and a variety of other Christian-themed works, like his Lamentation of Christ. But he is most well known for his humanist works depicting figures from classical mythology. Venus and Mars shows the Roman gods, Venus, the goddess of love, and Mars, the god of war, chilling in a forest, while four satyrs play around them. Primavera, meaning spring, also includes mythical figures. There's Venus again, along with Zephyr, Chloris, Flora, the Three Graces, Mercury, and even Cupid. Luckily, Primavera also survived World War II. Venus shows up again in Botticelli's most famous work, The Birth of Venus. No, those are balloons. There is Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Mama, what's the matter? Didn't you never see a naked chick riding a clam before? Which is interesting because it doesn't show the birth of Venus, but Venus fully grown, arriving on the island of Cyprus. It also looks like Flora's in the painting too. Notice with the birth of Venus and Primavera, Botticelli was less concerned with realism and perspective. Faces look almost cartoonish due to the noticeable outline painted around the face. Other masters like Leonardo use paint to blend light and shadow for a more natural look. Many people believe Botticelli's Venus was inspired by his neighbor, Florentine noblewoman Simonetta Vespucci, although she had actually already passed away before the paintings were made. Hey, did you know that Simonetta Vespucci was married to the cousin of Amerigo Vespucci, the explorer from which we get the name America? You'll learn about the age of European exploration later. There were also women artists, but Renaissance society generally restricted women's roles. However, a few Italian women became notable painters. Sofonisba Anguissola, Sofonisba Anguissola was the first woman artist to gain an international reputation. She is known for her portraits of her sisters and of prominent people such as King Philip II of Spain. Artemisia Gentileschi, Artemisia Gentileschi was another accomplished artist. She trained with her painter father and helped with his work. In her own paintings, Jane Teleski painted pictures of strong, heroic women like the biblical figure Judith. The Renaissance also influenced artists in Northwest Europe, but we'll save that for next time.